Galvanized Test Prep warmly welcomes you to a demo class on the SAT reading section. The reading section is often considered to be rather challenging, but if you master the strategies which we are about to teach you today, it will help you correctly answer the questions on the reading section of the SAT exam. So, what is on the SAT reading section in the first place? Well, the first thing that you need to know is that a full 65 minutes of your time at the test center will be spent on the SAT reading section. So that's a little more than an hour and answering questions based on reading passages is all that you would be doing in that time. How many passages? You will be presented with five passages and each passage will have a certain number of questions that you will have to answer. So how should you manage your time on the test? So for the reading section, uh, I would recommend that you plan to spend around 12 minutes per passage on average, right? Some passages could be slightly longer or more difficult than the others, but on average, uh, aim to spend around 12 minutes per passage. And how you would distribute these 12 minutes is you would allocate around four minutes uh, to read through the passage. Okay, just skim through the passage and then you will answer questions on that passage during the remaining seven to eight minutes. Right, so this is how I would uh, recommend that you spend your time on the reading section. Now, if um, some of you uh, noticed that the uh, time doesn't add up to exactly 65 minutes, for five passages multiplied by 12 minutes per passage gives you 60 minutes. So in case you're wondering where's the extra five minutes, well, my dear students, please have an extra five minutes for you on the test. You will need time to uh, mark the answer choices, um, you know, to circle those little bubbles. You would need time to maybe uh, relook at something so uh, or just check whether you've marked everything correctly. So it's always good to keep an extra five minutes that might come in handy. So this is how you will manage your time on the reading section. Now, let's try to understand what are the types of reading passages that you can expect to encounter on the test. First, you will expect or uh, you can expect a literature passage and this is typically an excerpt from a novel or a story. You can also expect a couple of passages related to science, inventions, technology, medicine and so on. And the remaining two passages will come from social sciences or the social studies and these can be passages related to economics, psychology, sociology or perhaps an important speech, document or, his, or an essay that is significant in American history. All right, so these are the different kinds of topics from, wi from which your SAT uh, passages in the reading section will be drawn from. And uh, definitely you will get one literature passage, a couple of science and technology passages and a couple of humanities related passages, right? And typically at least one passage will be uh, about something which is significant in American history. So just a, a word of caution, don't be scared if you see charts and diagrams on the reading section of your SAT. This is, um, this is an improvement or an ad rather an addition to the test that the SAT uh, has consciously taken. And so some passages might have associated charts, graphs, diagrams that uh, you will need to look at and there will now there might be questions based on the accompanying charts, right? Not all of the passages will have them, but uh, maybe a couple of the, these passages could have these charts. And typically, as you can expect, the literature passage is unlikely to have accompanying diagrams or charts. All right, so now that we've understood uh, the kinds of passages uh, and topics that the SAT reading section will present us with, let's move on to the types of questions that you can expect to encounter on the SAT. While this is not an exhaustive list, these are the typical kinds of questions that are posed on the SAT reading section. The first 
is the main idea question. What the passage is primarily concerned about. I mean, this is the purpose uh, for which they have written this passage, and this is the, they want you to have a key takeaway at the end of re, you know when you've done reading the passage, and that takeaway is this main idea. Next, you have the detail-based questions. So these questions test you on specific information that is conveyed in the passage. So it might be a small detail in some little line that's hidden in the passage, but you know that's that's why it's called a detailed question. Another type of question on the SAT reading section is the inference question. Here, they want to test your ability to arrive at logical conclusions based on the information given to you in the passage. Moving on, we have the vocabulary in context questions. Here, the question will present to you a word that was taken from the passage in a particular line and they will ask you to explain or identify the meaning of that word as used in the passage. All right, so words could have different meanings based on the context in which they are used. And in this case, you have to go back to that particular line and identify what exactly is the meaning in the sense in which they are using that word uh, in, in that particular line of the passage. The next question type is the tone question type. Here, you have to find out what particular emotion or attitude the author feels or displays towards the subject, right, to in, in the passage, so as you read the passage. Now, the author is at no point going to come out and explicitly say, hey, this is how I feel about this or this is my emotion. I mean, very rarely that's going to happen. But as you read the passage, based on the way the author uh, is putting forth their ideas, you will have to, um, you will have to elicit the tone or you will have to figure out what tone uh, and what emotion or attitude the author feels about the topic. Next, you have what are called evidence-based reasoning questions. Now here, you will have to locate specific lines from the passage to substantiate the correct answer for the question. In other words, the answer choices to the evidence-based reasoning questions will be actual lines lifted directly from the passage. And finally, you have the data reasoning questions. These are the questions for which you will have to use the data that's given in the graph, table, diagram, chart, whatever, and come up with conclusions based on the information in these pictures. All right, so let's take a quick run through again. Typically, you will expect, you can expect to encounter main idea questions, detail-based questions, inference questions, vocabulary in context, tone, evidence-based reasoning and data reasoning questions on the SAT. And usually a single question type, um, uh, some question types like the main idea question or the tone question don't repeat very often in the same passage. All right, so if a passage has one main idea, then they're unlikely to ask you more than one question on that one, my, one idea. All right, so now that we have um, an idea of the kinds of questions that are on the SAT, now let's start understanding what should be the strategy that you will use to answer these questions. Now, there is no magic bullet, all right? I have to tell you that and I have to be upfront about it. If there were, you know, everybody would be using it. So the strategy that you have to follow and, and this strategy, the application of the strategy comes with practice. But here are the basic elements of the strategy that we at Calvinize recommend to our SAT students. The first step is you have to skim through the passage. Now, when I say skim, it means that you have to kind of read through the passage, not, not spending too much time on it. Remember, we said don't, don't give more than four minutes to reading a passage, you know, on average. Right? So, but you have to get a general idea. Then you move on to the questions. So for each question, you first understand 
the task of that particular question, what it's trying to get you to do. Then you will locate the relevant portion from the passage that will help you answer that question. And then without looking at the answer choices, okay, it's very important, without looking at the answer choices, you have to anticipate what the correct answer could be. And then you move your palm or hand off the, the paper and you will see the answer choices and now you will eliminate all the wrong options until you arrive at an answer choice which most closely resembles the answer that you had anticipated in step 4. Alright, so this is the key strategy and this is what will help you answer these questions correctly if you practice this strategy well and for practice practice I mean you will have to work through a lot of passages it might be difficult at the beginning you might find yourself stumbling here and there but we are there to help and we will definitely insist on picking you up and taking you with us to make sure that you will that you can master the strategy and just so you remember the strategy here's a little acronym that you can use S-U-L-A-E Sule that, that sounds like potentially a name on Star Trek, doesn't it? Anyway, so Sule, right? Skim, understand, locate, anticipate and eliminate. For today's class, we have chosen this science passage and the entire passage should be visible on your screen. But don't worry, we are not going to consume it in one full chunk. We are obviously going to skim it one paragraph at a time. So let's begin the skimming. So what do we mean by skimming, right? The, remember, the first step of our strategy is to skim through the passage. So when we say, when we talk about sk skimming, we want to go through the passage so we can get a firm grasp on the context, which is the broad field and the topic of the passage, the structure of the passage, that is the way it's organized, the main idea and the primary purpose of the passage, as well as the tone of the author. Right? And the tone refers to the feelings that the author has towards a particular topic. And after we skim, we will proceed to the other parts of the strategy. And those parts are relevant when we come to a question. Right? But the first step is to skim through the entire passage before you actually start getting to the question. And this skimming should not take you more than four minutes per passage. But today we are going to take a little uh, longer because I am going to illustrate the, uh, the whole process to you and then uh, with practice you will get better and get faster with skimming. So let's take the first paragraph of the passage and let us start reading this. Right? So signals associated with tidal cycles could potentially provide advanced warning of certain types of volcanic eruptions hmm. so here i mean this passage has gotten straight to the point the they're talking about how tidal cycles which is the tides of the oceans and the seas could potentially provide an early warning that uh, a volcanic eruption uh, of certain type is going to take place right so the, uh, it's very important to visualize what's happening in the passage a lot of students find that building an image in their head as they read through uh, to the passage can help them keep track of things and navigate better so let's proceed a new study shows that sometime before a surprise eruption of new zealand's ruapehu volcano in 2007 seismic tremors near its crater became tightly correlated with twice monthly changes in the strength of tidal forces. So there is the study that they have done um, of, of a particular volcano in New Zealand in 2007 when the, they found that seismic tremors near the crater of the volcano became highly correlated, tightly correlated, right, with twice monthly changes in, in and it describes the kind of correlation that happens. So you have to pay attention to these words, adjectives, adverbs, and it's uh, the author is trying to communicate uh, through this. 
Looking at data for this volcano spanning about 12 years, researchers from NASA found that this correlation between the amplitude of seismic tremor and tidal cycles developed only in the three months before this eruption. This is very interesting. They're telling you that this correlation between the strength of the tidal forces and the, uh, the uh, seismic tremor at the crater of the volcano, that correlation, how, how well uh, they map with each other, uh, that developed only in the three months before this eruption. That means, and this is not something they're explicitly saying, but in your head, you have to think that, okay, so until then, for all these, uh, those 11 years and nine months, there was no correlation between the two and the correlation happened only in the three months prior to the eruption. It is also suggested that the tides could provide a probe for telling us whether or not a volcano has entered a critical state. This is again very interesting because they're suggesting that because of this correlation, perhaps the tides could provide us a means for telling whether or not a volcano is about to erupt, right? That, that would be pretty useful, wouldn't it? So now let's quickly summarize what we've learned in paragraph one. First, we know that the signals from tidal cycles could give us advanced warning or early warning of certain types of volcanic eruptions. Second, we know that we have 12 years of data available for a particular New Zealand volcano. And for this volcano, the seismic tremors near the crater were highly correlated with twice monthly changes in the strength of tidal forces. That correlation is very important to keep in our head. And that this correlation developed only in the three months before the eruption. So just keep this visual in your head and remember the four key points that the author is trying to say. So we've understood what's happening in paragraph one. And now we move on to the second paragraph. Let us move on to paragraph two. The Earth's tides rise and fall daily due to the gravitational tug of the moon as the Earth rotates. During full and new moons, the lunar gravitational pull lines up with that of the sun, which makes the daily tidal bulges a little larger. You can see in the picture, or you can imagine it, that when the sun and the Earth and the moon are in the same line, then the oceans bulge a little larger, the tides are higher. During the first and third quarter moons, the daily tidal bulge is a little smaller. And the first and the third quarter, you can imagine, imagine if it's a circle. So the first quarter and the third quarter would be when the moon and the earth and the sun are not in a straight line, but are perpendicular. This twice monthly change in the tidal amplitude is sometimes referred to as the fortnightly tide. So they are introducing a definition here, the fortnightly tide. While we normally think of tides in terms of rising and falling waters, these gravitational stresses also affect the planet's solid crust. This is an important sentence because they are trying to draw a distinction between what normally happens and uh, which is the uh, gravitational pull affects the oceans, but the gravitational stresses also affect the solid crust, which is the land surface of the planet. The question of whether or not the tidal forces can trigger eruptions is long standing in the earth sciences despite a lot of research. So here they're talking about a long standing question, which means an unanswered question, even though a lot of research has happened to try and answer that question. But researchers wanted to take a different angle with this study. So this is a very important point here. These researchers are not trying to answer this long-standing question of whether tides can cause volcanoes to erupt. But these researchers wanted to take a different angle. They're answering a different question. What's the question they're answering? They wanted to look at whether there is some detectable signal associated with tidal forces that can tell us something about a volcano's activity. So these researchers are not trying to find out whether tides cause volcanoes, but whether there's something about the tidal forces that can tell us about a volcano's activity. So let's quickly summarize this paragraph. 
First, we learned that the moon's gravity influences the Earth's tides. The amplitude of the waves, which is the strength of the tidal waves, changes according to the phase of the moon. Second, during full moons and new moons, the tides are bigger, they're more powerful. During first and third quarter moons, the tides are smaller. And this change in the amplitude is called the fortnightly tide. Next, the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun not only affects the waves, but also the Earth's crust. The question regarding the tidal influence on volcanic activity is unanswered. But researchers believe that detectable signals associated with the tidal forces can tell us something about the volcano. Now on to paragraph 3. The researchers chose to study the Ruapehu volcano in part because GNS Science, a research institute in New Zealand, has been closely monitoring its activity for years. The mountain is a popular tourist attraction and home to two ski resorts which makes it necessary for officials to be aware of any warning signs that it might erupt. So far so good. There's this mountain, it's volcanic and it's been monitored very closely because, well, it's a tourist spot. This monitoring provided a long and continuous data set. Remember what I said about adjectives and adverbs? Watch out. So this monitoring provided a long and a continuous data set for the researchers to study. In particular, the team was interested in data from seismic sensors located near the volcano's crater. So right near the crater of the volcano, they had, uh, this is where the seismic sensors were located that the, the Institute called GNS Science was monitoring. And these sensors obviously produced data and the research team wanted to study this data. Those sensors pick up volcanic tremor, a lower level seismic rumble that provides a persistent signal of activity within a volcanic system. So there's always going to be uh, activity within a volcanic system. Why do I say active always? Because they use the word persistent. So it's always going to be there. And those seismic sensors um, pick up the tremor. So this, this, uh, this low level rumble is uh, going to be monitored constantly by the sensors that were placed near the crater of the volcano. So let's summarize this paragraph. What did we learn? Well, first we learned that the researchers chose to study this particular volcano, the Ruapehu volcano, as, a re as it had already collected, the research institute, the GNS Institute had already collected 12 years of data related to this volcano's activity. Next, this volcano is also a major tourist destination. Thus, it had a continuous monitoring process to record potential warning signs of eruption. Obviously, we'd want to warn the tourists so they can you know, move out quickly. The research team was interested in data from seismic sensors located near the volcano's crater. And these sensors can detect volcanic tremors and sense even the lowest level seismic rumble that provides a constant signal of activity within a volcanic system. Let's move on to paragraph 4. Using a sophisticated statistical technique, the researchers combed through 12 years of seismic data looking for any period when the seismicity was correlated with tidal cycles. So the researchers studied the data from the sensor of, on top of the volcano for 12 years and they were trying to see if there was any connection between the tremor recorded by the sensors and the tidal cycles. What did they find? Let's find out. They found that for most of those 12 years, there was no correlation between tremor and tidal cycles except something. Now this is very very important because they are trying to draw your attention to a, a huge contrast and a finding that's happening. So for most of those 12 years there was no connection between the tidal cycles and the volcanic tremor except the few months before a steam driven eruption in September 2007 
when a strong correlation emerged again watch the adjectives and the adverbs a strong correlation happened just before the eruption so if you want to visualize what this might look like right and it's very important to keep visualizing you can imagine that there are two signals and they're mostly going their own way except that for some period of time they are connected they they feel they, they are they look related to one another right so you can imagine something like that and when does this happen just for some uh, just for some months before the eruption so what happened during those three months the amplitude of tremor rose and fell ever so slightly in lockstep with the fortnightly tidal cycle in other words during those three months just before the eruption there was you know a very very uh, per almost a perfect uh, synchronization a connect a, co a correlation a connection between the tidal signals and the volcanic tremor signals while the fluctuations in seismic aptitude amplitude were subtle the strength of the correlation to the tidal cycle was not the correlation was as strong as five sigma the researchers say meaning that the probability that the pattern arose by chance is about one in 3.5 million this is interesting and they are introducing some scientific terminology here or mathematical terminology so what, what they're trying to say is while the fluctuations in seismic amplitude were subtle in other words the volcanic tremor didn't jump up and down too much it was still moving upwards and, and downwards very slightly but the strength of the correlation how synchronized it that moving up and down of the tremor and how was with the tidal cycles you know how those two were synchronized was so strong how strong five sigma what does that mean it means that the likelihood that this connection happened randomly was about one in 3.5 million right a perfect time to say what are the odds right so this is, implies a very strong correlation in other words that synchronization that the fa the 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 uh, connection the similarity between the uh, i won't say similarity but the correlation the relationship between these two signals was not happening by random okay it was happening uh, uh, there was definitely a correlation between the two no other indicators that geologists typically use to anticipate eruptions raised any warning flags in 2007 Hmm. So there was nothing else to uh, warn the uh, researchers about eruptions. Therefore, in an endeavor to use it as a potential means of predicting similar eruptions in future, scientists and researchers intend to collect more data from other eruptions and other volcanoes to see if such tidal signals appear elsewhere. In other words, this is um, is a nice little conclusion that the passage draws and they are trying to tell us that because this correlation was so strong it was not random at all maybe just maybe we can use the uh, we can study the tidal signals and the volcanic tremor signals and see if uh, we can use the correlation if any to predict whether the volcano would erupt and therefore they're going to try and look for data from other volcanoes and tidal cycles around them to see if there are any uh, there's a this to see if it can be used as a way to predict the eruptions and this was quite an intense passage paragraph because a lot of data and this is where the finding of the researchers and their hope for the future you know or what they plan to do next is is all happening let's quickly summarize paragraph four so first the researchers found that there was no correlation between seismicity and tidal cycles for most of the 12 years except for a period of three months before the 2007 eruption during those three months the amplitude of tremor rose and fell in line with the fortnightly tidal cycle the change in seismic amplitude was small but the correlation between the tremors and the tidal cycle was very strong how strong well so strong that the fact that this correlation was random well the odds of it being random are just one in three and a half million 
And finally, the researchers hope to study more data at other volcanoes to see if tidal cycles can thus help predict volcanic